You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is another episode on investing, and I am really pleased to be able to talk about a subject that I think is really interesting, a particular approach to investing that I found out a while back and have talked about a few times. It's the permanent portfolio approach. Um, And to talk with me today, I'm very pleased to have a special guest who is the author of a new book on the permanent portfolio. It's Craig Rowland. Welcome to the show, Craig. Oh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you taking the time to have me here. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm I'm aware of your work because you run the uh, Permanent Portfolio Discussion and the Crawling Road blog, and you also have uh, the this uh, this new uh, book coming out. Yeah, it's a, a lot of fun. Um, uh, Crawling Road. People are interested in that name. It's just an anagram of my full name. I'm not that original. So uh, <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> I, so I started blogging about it. Um, probably about four years ago, just because it was interesting to me. And it, it just kind of, uh, I found out a lot of people really wanted help and, and it, with their investing advice, and it just kind of took on a life of its own. Mm. Well, I, I, I'm really interested to talk to you about the book, which I have read. Um, and I think it's a great book. I, I really recommend it for people who are interested in the permanent portfolio as an approach. Just before we get into the book itself, um, I, I think it'd be interesting for people who aren't aware to hear a little bit about your background because yours is a little bit similar to mine, I think, in that you were an entrepreneur who, who sold his business and, and then got into investing. Is, is, that, is that right? Is that how you sort of got into it? Yeah, I mean, the, the basic background is um, I, I began life working for the uh, chief of naval operations at the U.S. Pentagon. I helped maintain their networks. Um, I eventually uh, joined a small startup company uh, down in San Antonio, Texas, that was started by a group of guys from the Air Force Information Warfare Center. And I was hired as a network security auditor and a programmer. I basically wrote network attack tools uh, for a living to audit network for security vulnerabilities. Uh, that company was bought by Cisco. I worked at Cisco for a couple of years, and then I quit. And I started my own company, and I also <laughs> consulted with uh, another security company as well. Now, my own company, uh, we produce a network attack real-time network attack response system, which is uh, basically, it's too technical to get into here, but basically we detect attacks on the network and automatically respond to them. Mm. And that company was bought by uh, Cisco in um, uh, 2002, and I stayed there for a couple of years. The other company I helped as an early stage employee was called Tipping Point Technologies, and they were bought by 3Com Corporation, and they produced a, a very high-speed, multi-gigabit uh, intrusion prevention system. So um, basically, I got into uh, managing investments. Um, as an entrepreneur, I, I graduated from entrepreneur Uh, I'm sorry, from employee to a manager to having to raise venture capital. And so I I learned a lot of things about finance and investing just through running my own company. Mm. I became very disenchanted with a lot of investment advice I was receiving. And I thought about um, looking into other alternatives. And when I came across uh, Harry Brown's writings, um, I had discovered that he understood a lot of things about risk that uh, many other investment approaches and investment advisors simply did not understand. And so that's really kind of what drew me to this portfolio approach. Right, right. And you manage your own permanent portfolio yourself. You, you sort of, uh, you're responsible for your own investments as a private investor. That's correct. I, I eat my own dog food. I'm very proud to say that. Um, I was always very frustrated to read about all these investment advisors giving advice. And when they disclose their own portfolio, it would often be radically different from what they were telling other people to do. Mm. Um, I'm very happy to say I, I follow the advice uh, almost exactly. If you were to look at my portfolio, you, you'd realize it was almost the same. And I feel that's an obligation to people who read the blog or read the book. Uh, you know, I'm not a financial advisor uh, but at the same time, I feel like, uh, you know, I should always go first. And if there's a risk, I want to know about it. And because I do invest my own money this way, I like talking about it because if there's a weakness or someone has a legitimate concern, I, I want to know about it because my own wealth is at stake as well. And I want to make sure that other people have this knowledge and information so they can diversify their own life savings and not get into a situation where, you know, maybe they're in retirement and they find they're losing a lot of money or they can't retire or, or any of these other things that happen in life. Yeah, absolutely. I I really agree with you. I think it's it's really 
uh, essential that, you, as you say, the, the idea of eating your own dog food, the, the, having the integrity to actually do what you believe in. You know, one thing about brokers and um, individual investors, because I'm an individual investor too, and I'm very, very keen on that approach. I think that's uh, the, the best approach. But I think people who get into investing will definitely be faced with the argument um, by from investment professionals. And lots of people um, will experience this where an investment professional will say, you know, congratulations, well done, you're an entrepreneur or whatever. But Really, you know, you believe in the division of labor and you're, you know your field, but there are other people who are professional investors. They really understand the field. So, of course, you know, the wise thing to do is entrust your money to somebody who is far more skilled and far more experienced in this than you. You probably really don't know exactly what's going on. You've heard stuff about the markets. So you don't really understand it. So, you know, that's why you should go with a broker. Uh, so w what is, and I think that the permanent portfolio is a very different approach to that. So what do you, th what would be your response to that kind of argument? Yeah, you know, the problem is, is there, even if you find someone who's the smartest person in the world, they can't predict what the future is going to do. And it's, it's different than going to a doctor. You know, if you go to a surgeon to have you know, your tonsils removed, you assume that based on their certifications that they have a certain level of competence and that when you go under the knife, you're going to wake up, your tonsils will be out and you'll be okay. But with a broker, you just don't have that assurance because there's so many things that can happen in the world that they can't possibly know about that to assume that they can beat the market is a really tough, uh, tough sale. And, you know, the way I like to explain it, and I even talked about it a bit in the book is you know, you're going to get two uh, brokerage firms. One is full of Harvard MBAs. Another is full of Yale MBAs. And these guys are both looking at a stock. Let's say it's IBM. Now, one side of that firm is going to say IBM is a buy. And the other side might say, well, IBM is a sell. But the thing is, they have identical amounts of information, identical amounts of resources, identical amounts of intellectual brain power to analyze these things, but they both come to 180 degree opposite conclusion. And the only reason why that is happening is because there's not enough information to make a correct choice. If there was enough information, then they would both wind up on the same side of the deal. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happens. And so nine out of 10 trades on the market um, in this day and age are happening between professionals. So institutions, big mutual funds, big pension funds. So when you walk into a room, nine out of 10 times, you're squaring off against someone who has tremendous more resources available. But what's more interesting is nine out of 10 times, they're also trading against each other mm. and they're coming to different conclusions. So, so for when someone comes up to me and they say that they're going to beat the market, my immediate reaction is, well, what makes you so smart? that you can know what these other millions of people who've looked at the issue don't already have figured out. And more often than not, what you'll find is that anyone trying to beat the market average must underperform by the amount of their fees according to the market average. So if the market average is 10% a year and they're charging you 1% a year, on average, they're going to have about a 9% return. And that's just the way the math has to work because not everyone can be above average. Mm. And that's what a lot of people just don't seem to understand. And the paradox with a passive investing portfolio like the permanent portfolio is that you're not trying to beat the market. You're trying to own everything. You're trying to keep your costs very low. And the paradox here is that by trying to be average, you end up being above average because you're not falling into these traps people fall into of you know market timing and paying too much and on and on and on. And, and so when people say, oh, the permanent portfolio is beating the market, I would say, no, it's matching the market. It's just that most people can't even match the market. So it appears like you're winning mm. uh, the permanent portfolio, but really you're just sitting back and collecting all the profits that are there to be had without doing anything tricky. Right, absolutely. Now, this is probably a good time. We, we're going to go in a lot more detail, but this I think would be a good time maybe for people who are less familiar, if you could just give a, a brief description of what we mean by the permanent portfolio investment strategy. Sure. Well, what the permanent portfolio does is it takes four assets and splits them 25% each. And those assets are stocks, uh, long-term bonds, uh, short-term treasury bills as cash, and the final asset would be gold bullion. And the idea with these assets is that 
each one is tied to a certain phase of the economy, and that's how the diversification comes. So stocks do very well in a prosperous economy. Uh, Long-term bonds do very well under a deflationary economy or even a depression. Uh, cash kind of serves as a buffer during a volatile phase of a recession where the central bank is manipulating rates in a way to, to kind of calm down uh, inflation or other market problems. And the gold bullion is there kind of as a uh, protection against very bad inflation that's happening in the market. Mm -hmm. And so these assets are held 25% in each. And when one of the assets rises to 35% or more in value, you sell it down to 25% and you take the profits and you buy the other assets back up to 25%. And if an asset falls to 15% of the portfolio, then you take the profits from the other assets, you buy it back up to 25% to bring it in balance. And so this way, mechanically, you are buying and selling assets, harvesting profits from your winners and buying your losers when they're out of favor in the market. And the end result over the past 40 years is around a 9.5% compound annual growth, the worst loss it ever had. And this is for U.S. markets I'm talking about. Mm. Is, um, in 1981, it lost around minus 5%. So it, it's a very robust portfolio. It provides very good returns. And at the same time, it has extremely strong diversification against serious uh, bad market events that can happen at any moment. Yes, absolutely. And I think this, th that's a very helpful overview. And, and I want to go into each of those um, points to, to sort of look at them individually. And, and also, I think, to contrast this approach to, to the many others, because uh, what you just talked about, one of the key aspects that you talked about is diversification. And, you know, a lot of people um, think that diversification is, in some sense, um, a loser's game, so to speak. And, and there's a f famous quote by, I think it's Warren Buffett, who said, um, put all your eggs in one basket and then just watch that basket very carefully. Um, the idea being that, you know, really, in order to... to um, make, as mu make a, a, a reasonable return on investing, you can't diversify because you're going to be losing some and gaining some and it's all going to wash out and so forth. So what would your response be to that idea sort of embodied in that Warren Buffett quote? Uh, well, you know, first of all, you know, people need to understand that all investors have their own biases. So, you know, I could talk to some investors and they think gold's where it's at and they're going to say put 100% of your money in gold. Mm -hmm. I might talk to another one. Uh, the recent fad is to say put all your money in treasury inflation protected securities to fund your retirement. And then you get people like Warren Buffett who's basically a stock bug and he thinks you should be 100% in stocks. Mm -hmm. Now, he says that publicly, but if you look at his actual portfolio of all of his insurance company holdings and things like that, he actually holds a tremendous amount of money in bonds and cash. Cash. So it, he's not entirely um, right. That's another example of what we talked about: but, there being a difference between uh, what's said and what's actually done. Yes. Yeah, and, and people read into this. You know, he makes comments picking on gold, but what a lot of people don't realize is, I think, at, um, in the early two thousands, you know, somewhere around the order of a uh, hundred forty million ounces of silver at one time. Mm. So it, it's one of these things where. You have to be very careful listening to these people who are giving these these public quotes because uh, you know first of all they might not uh, the reporter reporting on it might not really know the full story and second of all you don't know what side of the trade they're on right mm. you, you know people could say thing I'm not saying Buffett is doing that I'm just saying in general we need to be careful and finally in in terms of um, you know uh, stocks for instance and you know put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket well you know that's all well and good but there are a large number of incidents that happen in this world that you're simply not going to be able to predict. And, you know, Warren Buffett has a certain level of resources and he gets a certain level of information and deals presented to him that an average investor is never going to see. So this whole idea of, you know, put all your eggs in one basket, you know, it's, it's an interesting quip, but it's not terribly, it's not terribly insightful, frankly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, if you look at the history of investing, it just isn't really even true. And even if I look through the 2000s with Warren Buffett's uh, performance in Berkshire, at one time I posted a graph, it was barely better than short-term treasuries. So, you know, he had gangbuster year in the 80s and 90s. The 2000s have been very bad for him being fully invested in just in stocks. So, you know, my suggestion is really you should be very widely diversified because you don't know what asset's going to do best. And th there was a recent interview from another very famous investor named Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Capital. And he's not very well known outside the institutional investing space, but he runs perhaps the largest, most successful um, hedge fund and institutional funds in the world. Um, equally 
uh, in my opinion, on par with anything Warren Buffett's done. And if you look at his portfolio, it's very, very close to what the permanent portfolio does. In fact, the theories are, are almost identical. And, you know, he would say the same thing. You never want to concentrate your bets because you're going to have one asset that's going to be, as he would call, ruinous. So each generation, you're going to have an asset that's going to do very, very badly. And if you happen to hit that spell, there's no, it doesn't matter how closely you're watching that basket, you're going to lose your shirt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my advice is don't think you're going to invest like Warren Buffett because, first of all, you probably don't know how he's really invested unless you look at his portfolio yourself. And second of all, it just really isn't good advice to concentrate your bets. And, you know, it worked out great for him. Uh, but at the same time, there's always going to be one guy who's at the top of the pyramid. And, you well, know, and if also, I was just going to say, it worked out great for him when that it when it just happened to coincide with the greatest stock boom in generations, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and uh, and it, it didn't work so great for him in the 2000s when, as you said, Berkshire hasn't really done that well anyway. So in some senses, you could say, well, it, it, maybe it's just – a lucky coincidence that he's a stock bug and was active in in a, in the best time to be uh, a stock bug. Um, it, it, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of luck involved here, and um, you know, for every one Warren Buffett, there might be a thousand guys who could have done just as well but didn't. Mm. And there's always going to be a guy at the top of the pyramid. You know, for instance, George Soros is a very wealthy man. Um, maybe it would have been him at the top. And instead of talking about owning stocks, he made a lot of his money from currency speculation. So would the conventional wisdom be, well, clearly you should be, you know, speculating in, in currency currencies. Yeah. money. And I would say, well, that's kind of ridiculous advice as well. So, you know, uh, you know, again, I would say Warren Buffett has a lot of good things to say. But if you look at his actual portfolio, what he holds, um, he's not all stocks. He, he, and really, he owns businesses. He's not really a stock investor. I mean, mm -hmm. he'll buy Dairy Queen. He'll buy Geico. You know, he'll own American Express. You know, so, so you know, be very careful about reading too much into what he's doing. Because when you peel back the layers of his holdings, they, they're not just all stocks. It, it, it just isn't how those companies actually work absolutely so we're talking about this this concept of really using diversification to make sure that whatever happens um, you're not going to be um, holding one of the uh, concentrated um, assets you're not going to have all of your assets in a ruinous asset as you said and and you, so you're not opening yourself up to that sort of catastrophic failure that might happen um, if you're heavily invested in one particular asset class and it fails. Now, in terms of the choice in the permanent portfolio, um, one thing that you contrast in the book is that when people look at assets and what assets to hold, the sort of, I guess, the mainstream view is to look at past performance and correlation between different assets and to say, okay, well, if I want diversification in my portfolio, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph stocks against bonds and, and bonds against um, precious metals or something else. And I'm going to look at the correlation between these. And that's the basis of diversification. And, and that's not really sort of what underpins the permanent portfolio idea. So can you contrast, you know, what the difference is in, in this approach? Yeah, I, I uh, am not a fan of using asset class correlation tables to make up a portfolio allocation um, simply because it, it doesn't work. And I noticed this many years ago when I was looking into the issue. So uh, an example I uh, bring up in the book is um, – stocks and U.S. Treasury long-term bonds. Um, from about the early 1970s to late 1990s, they would have had a correlation of about 0.5, which probably too much to get into here, but that would be a medium correlation, which means usually when stocks are going up, bonds are probably going to go up. And when stocks are going down, the bonds are probably going to go down. So if you're in 1999 building a portfolio and you wanted to diversify, you would say, well, I probably shouldn't own long-term bonds because they tend to move with stocks and I need something that's going to move away from stocks. So uh, I'm just going to skip on these long-term bonds. Well, what happened from about 2000 to 2012, or long-term bonds and stocks suddenly showed a negative correlation like minus 0.8, which is a very strong movement away from each other. So if you built this portfolio based on asset class correlations, what you found is that you might have skipped out on long-term bonds, but over the next 10 years, that would have been the best asset to own to diversify your stock risks. So for me, that whole model of looking at asset class correlations is, is seriously broken. 
because you know these assets don't move in relation to each other because one's doing something, the other's doing something else. So for instance, stocks aren't moving up and bonds aren't moving up because of each other. They're, they're doing it for very specific reasons in the economy. And usually it has to do with interest rates. So in the case of the permanent portfolio, it, it doesn't really pay attention to asset class correlations between each other. What it does instead is it looks at how those assets correlate to the economy. And in the case of stocks and bonds, for instance, bonds do very well when interest rates are falling. Mm -hmm. And stocks do very badly if inflation, if uh, interest rates are falling very sharply. That usually means there's a deflationary event happening. And so we saw this in 2008, um, where the stock market fell by 35, 40% at its worst, but US Treasury long term bonds went up 35%. And um, th this is a pure reaction of the market to what the interest rates are doing. And if you built a portfolio based on asset class correlations, that would have completely failed. The only way you get reliable diversification is to pick assets that move with the economy underneath and to basically disregard how the asset class correlations move with each other. And it's funny because I see people writing about the idea of asset class correlations. And then when the model breaks, they'll kind of have a cop out. They're like, well, asset class correlations change over time. Right. What <laughs> For what you saw, they then. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if they change that radically, maybe you're looking at the wrong thing. I mean, it, it, it just has, has just as much validity to say, well, stock market and thunderstorms over Texas are correlated. Mm. And then when suddenly you find they're not, you're like, well, you know, obviously the stock market and the thunderstorms in Texas, well, that correlation changes over time. But the reality is maybe they don't have any correlation at all because they're not related to each other. And, you know, so people need to look, get away from this idea of looking at asset class correlations. It, it doesn't work. Um, I show very clearly why it doesn't work. And they really need to look at a better model of diversification. And that's where the permanent portfolio, I think, is superior because it looks at this whole idea of matching assets to the economy underneath. And I think theory proves this out, that, that it is an effective strategy. And the way I tell people is, is this, you know, I, I don't want to concentrate a bet. I want to own something that someone's always going to want, no matter what's going on in the market. Okay, so if you don't want stocks, I'll sell you gold. You don't want gold, I'll sell you long-term bonds. You don't want long-term bonds, I'll sell you cash. But, you know, I always want to have something that the market's going to want. And when they want to come buy it from me, if the price is right, I'm more than happy to sell it to them. And I'm more than happy to trade it for them for an asset that they don't especially want. You know, and in 2009, 2008, people didn't want stocks. They wanted my long-term bonds. No problem. I'll rebalance out of those bonds and I'll buy those sorry stocks off you for a very deep discount. You know, no problem at all. And so it's an automatic way of buying cheap and selling expensive. It's, and there's no need for market timing or looking at charts or anything. And, you know, it's funny because I'll talk to people and they're always trying to fix stuff that isn't broken. And they want to market time and look at charts and this and that. And they're asking me about all these things about, you know, what's the market doing? And I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you what the S&P number is right now if you were to ask me. I don't know what the Dow Jones is. Mm. I can't even tell you right now what the spot price of gold is, okay? Uh, and, and the reason is, first of all, psychologically, look at your portfolio that much is guaranteed to cause you a huge amount of anguish internally, and you're going to start second-guessing things. And second of all, you can't do anything about it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, but you hear about a bad market event, bad news in the market, you're the last to know. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to react to it. I, I know guys who develop uh, algorithms for um, FPGAs for these uh, quaints on Wall Street, and it's to the point where they'll try to keep the network connection cables as short as possible to make sure they have a fraction of a second advantage over their competitors. I mean, you're never going to beat these guys. Mm -hmm. So you develop a strategy that could just deal with the unknown and, and let you just, you know, let it ride and not have to deal with it. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's what uh, appeals to me. One of the appeals of, the, of this approach is uh, it just takes out so much stress and, and uh, hassle to, to have a systematic approach rather than to have to try and really, you know, um, time the market and, and, and work out, um, you know, what, what on earth's going on and watch your portfolio all the time. But I do want to ask you um, another question about that, that approach of market timing versus the more systematic and, and um, strategic approach, I suppose you could say, of the permanent portfolio. Because certainly, you know, there are some things that, that some people will look at with regard to, say, for example, stocks or gold. And they will 
they'll talk about long term cycles um, in these markets and things that you can use to time the market. So, for example, often people will talk about the value of gold compared to other assets and compared to property. And they'll say, you know, you can look long term at the price of a, a, a two bedroom house and you can see the gold price going up and down and you can really see these long term cycles. And so, you know, what you can do is watch the value of gold relative to other things in the economy. And that shows you where we are in, in the cycle. And they also say with stocks, well, you know, you can look at the price earnings ratio of stocks. You can really see these long term cycles. And so the, the, the smart thing to do is to take, for example, the P ratios for stocks and the and the um, the value of gold uh, relative to other real things in the economy. And then you 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 basically time your investment. You move in and out between, for example, stocks and gold, depending on these types of indices. And that's not the approach to the permanent portfolio. But could you explain sort of, you know, why we take a slightly different approach to that and, and what, what our approach is? Yeah, you know, market timing doesn't work. I, I've looked at it every which way. I, you know, believe me, if I thought it could work, I'd be doing it. And humans are programmed to see patterns. You know, that, that's why we see faces on the, you know, surface of Mars. And, you know, pe people want to see patterns. They want to draw conclusions. Uh, but there's nothing about a line on the chart that says that it needs to continue doing that going forward. You know what I mean? People look at these charts and they try to derive all sorts of uh, meanings from it. Um, in terms of cycles, uh, it, it, the thing people need to understand as well is that there really aren't many cycles going back that you're that people derive these conclusions from. I mean, you know, how many cycles are they looking back to the early 1900s? You know, what is that? Maybe a, a sample size of three or four, you know, depending on markets going up and down. Mm more advanced issues as well that they don't often understand, which is, you know, the U.S. and the world was on Bretton Woods gold standard from 1971 um, all the way back to 33. And prior to that, they were on a gold standard. Uh, plus, there are other historical events, too, that really changed the course of history. You know, what happened if World War One and World War II didn't happen? Would Germany be a lot different place? Uh, what happened if World War II was successful? Would your, all of Europe be a different place? So, you know, you have these historical events mixing in as well. And so I don't like looking looking at a spreadsheet alone, you know, I, I call it extra spreadsheet risks, you know, people look at the spreadsheets, they want to extrapolate into the future. But there's no guarantee that a certain cycle needs to repeat. And even something with like the stock market, you mentioned the PE ratio, I agree, it could be a good way to show you an indicator that the stock market might be over or undervalued. But you know, it's it's called the PE ratio price to earnings, and it can go up or down depending on how the earnings change. So you might see a high PE ratio and say, well, the stock market's clearly overvalued. But if that quarter results come in and the companies do better than expected and the earnings go up, then all of a sudden the PE is going to fall mm. and surefire timing indicator has now proven wrong. And not just wrong, but you've missed out on the gains that would have happened had you just left things alone. So, you know, there's there's always multiple sides to the story here. And I just find in general, it's better and more profitable and safer not to market time. And, um, you know, there are things that can happen in this world so quickly that uh, market timing really won't save you. And certainly if you have things set up to happen automatically, we've had flash crashes and other things going on. It could whipsaw you out of the market. It could recover immediately. You might lock in a ton of losses as the stock market recovers, and then you missed out on them. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of risks involved with market timing, not just to mention the stress. And finally, another point I mentioned in a book as well, you know, Mike, Mike and I are really big about not market timing things. And, you know, we, we mentioned in there, we're like, look, if this guy Hawk and his market timing scheme, if it was really successful, why would he be telling you this information, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be quiet and just rake in all those profits for yourself? I mean, certainly they wouldn't be on the internet selling it for 1995 and a free cup of, you know, free coffee mug while supplies last. And, <laughs> It's just, you know, people need to really use their heads. And I, I really think it's it's an advanced investor is going to recognize that this stuff doesn't work and they're going to just stay out of it. And if you stay out of market timing and you run a passive portfolio that holds these assets, you're almost certainly going to beat these market timers. Um, and I, I post that on my blog. Market timers are my easiest money. I make the, the easiest money from people selling in and out of the markets. Uh, right. Hand to me their money. And, you know, people could play this game. I, 
I'm just warning you, you know, it, it really doesn't work. And if anyone could show me proof, conclusive proof that it works, meaning I don't want to see your back tested theoretical results. I want to see actual numbers of how much money you made consistently over time and consistently over time after fees, expenses, and taxes are taken out because these are also really expensive strategies people do. And I just don't, you know, I just don't see it. I, I just don't believe it works. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the other thing is that uh, the more the the more passive the investment strategy is, like the permanent portfolio, a very passive one, the less you're having all that drag from taxes and expenses. That every time you try and time in and out, you you you've got to do so much better in order to make that worthwhile because you you're actually taking on all of the capital gains tax and the expenses and uh, trading expenses and so forth. That it means that you have to be not just better, but that much, even better <laughs> in order to make it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's really tough. If if let's just say for sake of ease of calculation, the markets are turning 10% and your strategy has a 1 to 2% overhead just to run it. You know, you're going to have to make 11 to 12% just to match what the market earned. Mm. You know what I mean? That means you need to beat the market by 10 or 20% and you need to do that each year. Good luck. You know, if you market by that much each year, you should be running your own fund. And uh, I've just never seen anyone be able to consistently do it. And I, I just don't think it works. And, uh, you know, if it even if it does work in very remote cases, the amount of stress and time involved, I just don't know if it's really going to pay off quite the way people think. So, you know, I, I don't do it. And I've warned people against market time. And I know no matter how much I say it, people are going to try it anyway. And, mm -hmm. you know, Wish you luck, but um, you know it's not going to work. I'm just going to sit back and collect your money. That's just kind of how I. <laughs> right, right, excellent. Well, looking at the the book and the uh, you know the the uh, information that you've got in there, which I think is is really useful. Um, I think it would be fair to say that you know the overall strategy of the permanent portfolio has not changed since Harry Brown uh, wrote the book. But that what you've done is to look at the practical implementation you know today in terms of the markets that we're, that we're in do you, is that a fair assessment of, of your view of, of how you've sort of updated the strategy yeah the the strategy basically finalized itself by around 1987 with the four asset classes and the idea here was to simplify it down to the point where an average investor you know could do it without any problems. Now, since that time, index funds have come on the scene and some additional exchange traded funds have come on the scenes and certain other pieces of information that he advocated, such as, for instance, uh, overseas storage of gold, they become obsolete. Mm. And so the whole thing needed to be updated pretty much from uh, top to bottom. Uh, so the core strategy still remains. We just updated it with uh, modern information on how to implement these things, as well as modern examples of how things can go wrong. I, I think you probably saw in the book, we had a large number of examples of, of where not following a particular piece of advice could, could lead to problems. And uh, certainly from 2008 to 2011, we've seen a lot of market volatility, extreme volatility, big institutions go under. We've even seen outright theft of assets like MF Global. They literally just stole customer custodial accounts. Yes, yeah. That. You, know, you know, all these warnings that Harry Brown talked about, it's unfortunate that he passed away so many years ago because I think if he saw some of these things come to fruition, he kind of validated a lot of what he had to say. I mean, you know, in 2008, for instance, nobody would have thought that the world's first and largest money market fund, the reserve fund, I think the time would have broke the buck and froze all customer assets. Mm. But would go to his warning to say only own, you know, a treasury bill money market fund because there'll always be liquid no matter what happens in the market. And, you know, since that time, I've seen a lot of other investment authors update their strategy from lessons they learned and in a way even adopt some of Harry Brown's own cautions. And um, this was something kind of as an entrepreneur and coming from the security background, I'm always cagey about risk. And I really felt Brown, you know, addressed a lot of these things. So the book basically, yes, we updated it and we gave it um, a lot of new information for people who wanted to implement the strategy. Um, you can go anything from a very simple single mutual fund all the way up to a more elaborate strategy that even holds gold overseas and uh, several easy options that we laid out. So it just depends on where you want to take it. Yeah. yeah. So just looking at the different asset classes and the kinds of things that have changed in the investing landscape um, since Harry Brown wrote that book, it seems to me, I think that you're, you're absolutely right, the, you know, the things that we've seen changing have really validated 
the approach um, uh, significantly and and uh, and shown that exactly the kinds of risks that Harry talked about um, are not only possible but have happened. And so, you know, it really validates the approach. Just looking at the kinds of things that have changed, if we start with stocks, it seems to me that, you know, when Harry Brown wrote the book, um, the idea of uh, just really holding the entire stock market in an index fund and being having quite a passive approach to the stocks in terms of just uh, you know not not trying to market time and not trying to stock pick and so forth that seems to be actually a lot more mainstream now um, there's a lot of people um, like the sort of the bogleheads type approach who who are very interested in in that approach to stocks and as far as I understand back when Harry wrote this that was a bit less less mainstream do you think that's a change that's happened since the original book yeah, I, I mean, originally when they came out with this idea in the, the early forms in the late 70s, um, the idea of having a passive portfolio that didn't market time was basically unheard of. There were a few lone voices out there. And at the time in the, the late 70s, uh, Jack Bogle at Vanguard had just started the S&P 500 index fund. He was being mocked by the industry that it would never work. I think they called Bogle's folly. Um, there were some other people, maybe Burton McKeel, if I'm pronouncing his name right, he had the uh, random walk down Wall Street. So there were a couple people advocating these passive portfolios, but you know, Harry Brown was a famous gold speculator and he completely shifted his strategy to one of a passive portfolio. And over time, he kind of graduated more and more uh, towards using the index funds as they became more available. So when he wrote about it in the mid '80s, the index funds still weren't quite available in a wide market yet. You know, he still had Vanguard out there, where they were about it. And as the late '90s rolled around, the S and P 500 became more and more accepted. It's still not something everyone's doing, but I think more and more people are realizing it, it's the way to go. And nowadays, you have the total stock market funds, which I, I generally recommend, um, even though the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is a, a very good passive fund, but the total stock market owns everything. I think it's even more true to form. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these passive approaches have come about. But even then, people still want to market time the things. <laughs> and, right. Uh, you know, even some of these ETFs now come out and just because something is an exchange traded fund doesn't mean it's an index fund. Even some of these funds now try to market time. I think Wisdom Tree and some other these other funds do some uh, weird waiting to try to beat the market, and n none of that stuff works. So you know, even though you have this really good tool on a passive index fund, people again still want to try to go in there and and beat the market. But fundamentally, the permanent portfolio is a passive strategy. It's always been that way. And you know what's altered over the years are basically the emergence of of new tools. Mm -hmm. Same time, it is called a permanent portfolio. But I think some things have changed in the market landscape to sometimes require a review of it. So for instance, um, uh, the Swiss franc is really no longer tied to a gold standard of any type. And the Swiss central bank has been uh, manipulating the uh, their currency to match the euro to keep it kind of under control. So in the original permanent portfolio advised holding Swiss francs, and um, I think the mutual fund still might today. And you know, today if you were to ask me, I'm like, no, I wouldn't own Swiss francs. Yeah. You know, there is a chance that things could change in the future in regard to the portfolio, but the four assets it has now are pretty stable and they can be had very easily by the average person uh, very cheaply as well. And, and so I think, you know, right now the core of the philosophy is still very, very much remains intact and it's still a very powerful tool to diversify. Yeah. It seems to me just regarding the permanent portfolio funds that those funds kind of locked in at a time when the strategy was being developed and it was a little bit more cumbersome, a little bit more complicated and it held more thing, more assets, and you had the Swiss francs and stuff. And it seems what happened is that Harry then went on to further simplify and just say, look, let's just have 25% each, stocks, bonds, cash, and gold, and be done with it, so to speak. And that the, as far as I can see, the funds haven't really kind of updated. They never really got to that, that further level of simplification that, that, um, that, that he suggested in, in the book, Fail Safe Investing. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I can't speak to his thinking or the fund. I, I kind of read into it on my own. So, you know, my own opinion is basically, yes, he wanted to simplify it. Um, I think in a way, he eliminated assets that really weren't going to prove very useful to the portfolio. So, for instance, they, they got rid of silver. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of silver. I really want to hold gold for inflation protection because it's a, a it's the same exact asset that the central banks hold in their own vaults. Mm. And, and 
very unique thing. A lot of people discount it. They they come up with all sorts of say, oh, well, you know, only people wear tinfoil hats on gold and this and that. I'm like, well, the people printing your money hold it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they're they're not holding, you know, they're not holding inflation protected securities down there. So, you know, it's a type of thing where he did simplify it. Um, the fund, I suspect for them to change the fund allocation would be kind of a major uh, deal with the shareholders and, you know, a lot of regulatory issues. So I'm not right. sure how much flexibility they really have. Um, so that might be why they're kind of locked into it. Um, but, you know, I really can't speak to the fund very much. You know, the fund's fine if you want an all in one solution. Um, it, it just, it has its own limitations, but if you, if you want the convenience, it's something, you know, to consider. Uh, but I, I feel the four way split works better, certainly for my situation. Yeah. Right. Well, um, you mentioned gold, and that's another thing that, that's uh, obviously gone through a lot of changes since uh, the original permanent portfolio strategy uh, came about. I was very interested in the book because I, I know that um, for American readers, you know, the the issue of geographic diversification, holding gold abroad, is significantly more complicated now than it was when Harry Brown wrote the book. It le less so for um, people based outside the states, but still. You know, there's a lot of stuff that, that I'm sure people will find very useful um, in the book about, you know, how to address the question of how to get geographic diversification and hold hold gold abroad. One thing I wanted to to um, just touch on with you, which I found very interesting uh, in the gold uh, chapter of the book, is that, you know, one thing that, that has become very popular recently is services like bullion vault and gold money. And those have become, you know, a quite an easy way for people to, and of course, the gold ETFs as well. But, but for people who think about earning physical gold, then those kind of services have, have become very, uh, a very easy way for people to get into owning physical. But, you know, your, uh, your sort of view in the book, uh, as far as I understand, is that they're not really achieving the level of uh, security and the level of um um, sort of direct um, asset holding that that uh, that would be best is that is that right? Could you clarify your thoughts on those services? Yeah, the the number one best way to hold gold is uh, what's called a custodial account at a bank or some other financial institution, which basically means you have a contract directly with who's holding the gold that they're going to hold X amount of gold for you set aside. Okay, so that's the optimal now. The, the optimal plus on that is they're holding it outside the country from where you live. And again, this is to geographically diversify uh, your assets in case something very bad were to happen where you live, either geopolitical problems or man-made disasters or natural disasters or whatever it is. So that's the best way to hold it. So it, everything scales down from there. You know, the next step down from there might be an unallocated account. Uh, overseas. And then next step down from there could be an ETF or one of these gold storage services. So I kind of put the gold storage services at the same way as an ETF. Um, they are convenient, uh, but they're not necessarily for safety. There still are people uh, between you and, and the asset. And in general, when I look at those services, the first question I have to ask is, is something were to go wrong, who's going to be in, in the way. And in my feeling is I'd rather deal with a larger financial institution that has deep pockets, right? That I can go after if there's a problem, you know? So for instance, I think it was maybe gold money or someone's located in the Jersey islands. Mm. Uh, that really isn't a benefit to me as an owner in that company, because if there's ever a problem, do I need to go to the Jersey Islands to, to go after someone. I need to hire an attorney. I mean, who, who really gets the protection from there? And a lot of these services are holding the money at the same vaults. There's Viamat and, and Zurich and the, the tax-free trade zone, the Zurich uh, International Airport. That's where these vaults are located. So there are lots of different services there that are, that are using the same people behind the scenes. Um, the other thing, too, that would concern me with some of those services, um, I think Bullion Vault used to do it. Maybe they stopped. But they kind of allow transactions between customers, almost like, a, I don't want to call it like a currency, but it, you, they allow people to trade between each other. And that kind of brings back this whole e-gold view to me. And e-gold was shut down by the U.S. government claiming um, money laundering and Ponzi schemes and stuff like that. So uh, I, I'm very careful whenever 
you know, a small service with not very deep pockets could be potentially targeted by the government. Right. Like, what I'd rather see instead is if you wanted to hold gold overseas, um, maybe you should use the Perth Mint. You know, and the reason is Perth Mint only is doing gold bullion. They're owned by the Western government of Australia. I'm not really worried about the U.S. government coming in and shutting down the government of Western Australia. They're, those guys are going to tell the U.S. government to take a flying leap. Mm -hmm. And they have the money to back it up. And they also have sovereign immunity to back it up. So, you know, it's one of these things, same thing for a, a large bank overseas. You know, these banks have custodial agreements with lots of customers. They're not just going to be easily targeted. And at the same time, I, I feel that there's enough regulatory oversight that they're not going to mismanage the funds. And, you know, with these gold storage services, they're fine for what they are. I, I don't want to be too critical of them. Mm -hmm. But I just not sure. It's a little too opaque for me to really understand all the risks. So I would rather see people use something else. If if you wanted to go through the hassle of custodial agreements and segregated storage, I, I just think there are other options out there I, I would rather use. Yeah, that's very, very interesting and very useful. And I think, uh, you know, it, it will be interesting for people to to think about what they're doing with regard to gold because as you say like many of the assets that, that uh, we hold in investing are paper assets and there is counterparty risk issues and the permanent portfolio takes counterparty risk issues very very um, seriously but i guess what i get from what you're saying is if you're gonna really look at gold as being the the one part of your portfolio which you can have really as few um things between you and the asset itself as possible and that you put it in a very safe place outside your country just in case something terrible happens or whatever, then I guess the, the idea is you, you want as little barrier as possible and, uh, and that would be why you would see, um, see those kinds of companies as not necessarily you know, a big problem, but just not the same thing as literally going to a bank and opening a safety deposit box or having segregated storage. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, you know, the risks with everything, right? We should understand that. It's just as, you know, if you were outside the U.S. and you could open up an account at the Canton Bank of Zurich, I'd much rather see you do that than to use a gold storage account. Because the Canton Bank of Zurich has been around 140 years. They're insured by the Canton of Zurich. Um, you know, they have the Swiss reputation behind them. I just think it would be a better idea. Mm -hmm. You know, you could use the Perth Mint. I'd say that's probably a good idea. If you could use one of the other services we had listed in the book, that would probably also be a better idea. I, I just equate the gold services to an ETF. And in some ways, I might trust the ETFs more, <laughs> strange as it sounds, again, because most of the people running them have very deep pockets and there's very, very uh, tight regulatory oversight over these ETFs. You know, the, the SEC um, does track these things very closely and there's a lot less wiggle room for them to, to do things and they would be susceptible to shareholder lawsuit very readily if there were any problems so yeah I, you know I, I don't want to dwell on the gold services too much I know they're popular I'm going to ruffle some people's feathers but you know in general if you're going to go through the hassle um, I, I'd say that they're probably better custodial accounts that you can use mm. right that's very useful um, I think just just uh, to cover the uh, the long term treasuries and and the cash element. I mean, there are a lot of people um, get a bit uh, confused about the inclusion of cash in in uh, in the portfolio, and also the the long term treasuries. Um, you know, there, there's a the whole discussion about uh, the the value of those um, at the moment. But I, I just wonder, what, what do you think has kind of changed? with those two asset classes since since the original book to to the book that you've written updating the permanent portfolio what's changed in the investing landscape in terms of holding cash and holding long-term treasuries well you know clearly the zero interest rate policy the fed has been the major change so you know treasury bills at this point are basically paying nothing mm -hmm. and uh long-term bonds have been part of the federal open market um operations to basically buy those treasuries and to use that money to, you know, inject extra funds into the market that they thought is appropriate. So a lot of people complain about the yields of treasuries being so low and um, I hear it and I get it. But at the same time, uh, those long-term bonds have been a tremendous lifesaver at times. Mm. And if 
you hold all the assets in the portfolio, even if the long-term bonds, the, the yields were to rise and they were to, to lose a lot of value, chances are your stocks or the gold would probably go up enough to offset those losses. And, and this kind of gets back to this whole idea of assets and isolation that we talk about in the book. It's very important to look at the portfolio in total. So, uh, you know, today the cash interest rates at zero, long-term bond rates are somewhere around 3% and people are nervous about buying them. And I, I suppose my answer would be things can go on a lot longer than you think um, in terms of low interest rates. And Japan has had very low interest rates for a generation now. Mm, yeah. German rates have fallen a lot too as the euro is having problems. So there's no promise out there that rates have to go up. And people have been predicting long-term bond rates would be going up now for years, mm -hmm. years, years, years. And they've been dead wrong. And they might continue to be wrong. But if they're right, and you own the stocks and the gold in the portfolio, you'll probably still be okay. And this kind of gets back to that splitting of the assets. So you're not gonna have anything that, that's ruinous. You know, if you have 25% of long-term bonds, and let's say tomorrow morning you woke up and they fell by 50%, Minus 12.5% impact the portfolio, right? You'd lose half of 25%. Mm. It's not great, but it's not a disaster. You know, it's not like in 2008 where people lost 40% of their value of their portfolio. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that, that assumes no other asset goes up. And, you know, recent blog posts, I talked about capital flow in a portfolio. And what I mean by that is kind of we talked on, uh, touched about it earlier was, um, I always want to own something that someone else wants. So if money's flowing out of long-term bonds, where's it flowing to? Is it going to stocks? Is it going to gold? You know, it's probably going to go to one of those assets in there. So there's always going to be something in the portfolio that's probably going to be benefiting from whatever's going on in the economy. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's like a rudder on a ship. It might take a little bit of time to turn, but typically it, it will turn if you get the portfolio time. It's not going to be instantaneous. But more often than not, uh, you'll find that the losses will gradually get erased and that the portfolio will start pulling in a profit again. And while everyone's arguing about these long-term interest rates, the past five years or so I've been holding these bonds, I, I've just been sitting back collecting interest payments. Mm, <laughs> yeah. And I have to say, it's been really interesting for me to see because I, I first read about the permanent portfolio before 2008 and I got in before 2008. And I read, you know, Harry Brown saying you're holding long term bonds for a, a period of, uh, of depression, uh, of long term deflation in the in the economy. And if you look at the Great Depression, everything did really badly except long term bonds. That's why we hold them. And I remember thinking, wow, I wonder, you know, that's interesting. I wonder what will, you know, oh, well, I'll, I'll buy in because I, I accept that you need to be prepared for every strategy. But I, I certainly didn't expect to see the kind of deflationary events that we've seen happening with um you know from 2008 when bonds were really really important within the portfolio yeah you, you know it's interesting i i also have been using the portfolio well before uh, uh 2008 as well and you know all these economists were saying deflation is simply not possible anymore right that's what they used to say mm. when the housing bubble was starting to shake. I, I sometimes post on the Bogleheads forum, and uh, probably in the spring of 2008 or something, I made kind of a off the cuff remark. I said, "Well, the housing market, if the prices fall, that'll be highly deflationary." And it just kind of went by in passing. And that's kind of exactly what happened. It's not that I'm predicting the future. It's simply saying, uh, and this was an, a discussion about bonds. I simply say, you don't know what's going to happen, and if we get bad deflation, you'll be happy to have them. And it, it is amazing how it all worked out. I mean, people realize suddenly, oh, geez, I guess deflation can happen in a modern economy. You know, these central banks are pulling a lot of strings. And one of the things the permanent portfolio has embedded in it, although I, I don't talk about it much, and, and Harry Brown only talked about it a little bit, is it's very closely tied to monetary policy, and it's designed to react to how the modern central banking system works. And, you know, as these guys are pulling the strings, again, the permanent portfolio is always going to have an asset that's going to benefit from it. And I, I think that that's one thing that isn't commonly uh, talked about. And long-term bonds is one of those. You know, the uh, the the uh, interest rates collapsed. The uh, Fed went in and started buying bonds and doing some other things to try to prop things up and, and lower the yields. And, uh, you know, permanent portfolio guys, again, we've been, you know, whistling past the graveyard, I guess. But um, oh, I had... yeah, Th this is the fascinating thing is that a lot of people 
look at um, government monetary policy and they say, look how the government uh, uh, intervenes in the economy and isn't that a real problem? I'm very concerned about government intervention, so I'm going to go all out into gold uh, because I'm very concerned about uh, hedging against the government uh, ruining the currency or the government intervention. And they go into gold. But the, th the interesting thing is that, you know, the intervention that we've seen has been massive bond buying. So if you want to protect against, you know, the, the, the government, uh, is, uh, uh, the state intervening in, in and kind of messing around with the markets and to hedge, then owning bonds is actually a really sensible thing to do because that's one of the things that the, the Treasury does is to go on a massive bond buying spree, which takes value for, uh, out from other parts of the economy. But, but you know, if you're hedged like that, you're OK because uh, it, it's a quarter of our assets. So, you know, we just sort of ride it out, as you say. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. It's, um, you know, I read the same arguments about owning lots of gold, and I get it that it could happen. But just because the Federal Reserve is making money available doesn't mean it's being lent out by the banks. And it also doesn't mean that people are taking that money because if they're already up to their eyeballs in debt, right? They're not going to take more money out. And, and that's where this whole monetary theory of injecting liquidity and it's on and on and on kind of falls flat on its face. So, you know, the Fed would very much like this money to go into the economy. They very much would like to start causing more inflation, but there's no promise or guarantee that they're going to be able to pull it off. And again, Japan's a perfect example. The Japanese banks are basically giving money away. And, you know, you can't make people spend money that they don't want to take on as as debt um you know so it, it, you're right if you own these long-term bonds and all of a sudden you know again we're running this store and i always want to have an asset i want to sell to someone well look who comes waddling in but the u.s government <laughs> they want to right. buy my right hey no problem you know you have the money to do it. Um, and we don't know how long that's going to last. And you know, the gold, the gold people might be right, but I own 25% in gold as well. I, uh, you know, I think I'll be okay. And uh, you know, and again, while everyone's arguing about all this, I'm just sitting back collecting those interest payments. I'm perfectly fine doing that. Absolutely. Well, that that's a really, really helpful overview of, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of the way that the, uh, the strategy has kind of been updated. And I, I again, I really recommend that people take a look at the book. I just want to finish by asking you, you know, when you look at other approaches that are out there for the individual investor, especially if somebody, let's say that they're starting out, um, they may be, you know, looking at the, the sort of different options open to them. If they are, if they buy into the idea of, of, uh, of diversification and of taking care of their own money, do you see any kind of alternative com competing strategies to the permanent portfolio? And, you know, what is your view of what the other options are that, that you think um, somebody should sort of consider? Uh, well, you know, I'm not so dogmatic that I, I can't recognize other advantages. First of all, if you are using a passive investing strategy of, of uh, stocks and bonds and you're owning um, a total stock market fund and maybe, um, you know, a, a good quality U.S. Treasury bond fund, you are at least, you know, 80, 90% of the way there. Mm -hmm. And I would say I would want to have a hard asset added into that mix. Okay. So even if you're not following the permanent portfolio, I tell people, even if you don't want to follow it, you should have at least 10% of your money in physical gold bullion. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, what I find by looking at the data are that stocks can do well, bonds can do well, and physical bullion can do well, but they each tend to do well on their own time. So even having a modest allocation, 10% to gold, it really could provide a lot of very strong diversification to a standard stock bond portfolio. So if you're a passive investor and you add some gold to it, you probably would get a lot of the benefits of the permanent portfolio um, over time. I, I'm not going to say it's going to do as well, mm. but you would have a lot of protection in that. Now, if you're not even passively investing. If you're market timing, you're using actively traded funds, if you're following trends and reading charts, and all that stuff, um, you're wasting your time. And you know, I, I know that might be harsh for you to hear, but again, it's guys like me just sit back and collect your money and I thank you for playing the game. Uh, but you're gonna lose. And um, I think that you should develop a strategy that can deal with the, the unknown future, the uncertain future that we have. And that, that is a much higher level of investing wisdom uh, you know, and it took me years to get to that point as well. I've tried some of these other things. So, you know, I, I'm with you. But um, 
If you're frustrated with these other approaches, I say, first of all, you should look into passive investing strategies. I think you should index. I think you should keep costs very low. And if you're in a stock bond portfolio right now, I, you know, I would advise holding some gold bullion in that, um, you know, regardless of what the price is, I'm not here to advocate any particular asset. I'm very agnostic towards it. I'm just saying that the future is unknown and it's a good idea to uh, stay widely diversified. And, uh, you know, that that's what I recommend people do. I think that's great advice. And I, I also think that, you know, it's really important for people to evaluate this for themselves, have a look for themselves. I did back test uh, just to see what it was like before I got into the permanent portfolio. I did have a look at how it would have performed uh, for the 10 years prior to myself getting in. And uh, I thought very carefully about it and looked at other things. And I just want to add that obviously this is also a discussion between two independent investors and we're not financial advisors and this isn't um, financial advice. And so it really is important for people to, uh, for everyone listening to take uh, responsibility for their own money. And I do think it's a great idea to, to look at alternatives to the views that we've expressed and come up with the, you know, your own view about uh, how, to, how to move forward. But uh, Craig, I really appreciate you coming on. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And before you go, can you uh, tell people how they can find out more about the book and about your blog? Sure. Uh, my blog is uh, www.crawlingroad.com. And again, it's just crawling like you're crawling on the ground and road, just an anagram my name. Uh, the book is called The Permanent Portfolio. Harry Brown's long-term investment strategy. Uh, currently, it's on the Kindle form on Amazon, but in a couple of weeks, it's also going to be in hardback and also additional electronic formats that uh, might work with your own e-reader if you're not using the Kindle. So you can uh, look for it online over at Amazon or some other bookstores, and it will be there. And uh, hopefully, you'll read the book and um, uh, get a lot out of it. Uh, Mike and I, we had a lot of fun writing the book. We feel it has a ton, a ton of useful information. Even if you're not following the permanent portfolio, we think as an investor, you're probably going to learn something reading this book. And uh, that even includes people who are skeptical about particular assets in the permanent portfolio. So, uh, you know, we make our case, and uh, hopefully, uh, you'll read the book and you'll enjoy it. I, I totally agree with that. I found a lot of very useful information. And even for somebody who's following the portfolio, I actually found some very, very uh, useful uh, things to, for myself to consider in there. So thanks again, Craig. It's been great talking to you. Okay, thanks again, Jake. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.